Hello, welcome to episode 28 of our weekly Cricket Her vodcast. We're delighted to be coming to you from Edgefaston, where we have been accredited to cover the final of the Rachel Hoho Flint Trophy. So we're really excited about that and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but first of all, we've actually seen the return of some um, full member nation women's international cricket this week, haven't we, Sid? We've been spoiled by riches um, and you were particularly watching the first two matches in the Australia New Zealand series. So um, what, what have been your thoughts, other than obviously, I guess, being happy to be watching international women's cricket again? Uh, yeah, so um, we're two matches into the New Zealand-Australia series now. Um, Australia won both matches mm -hmm. and um, we've been watching them on the television. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's been good to watch some cricket again. Um, Elise Villani's been very good on commentary. I've enjoyed listening to her. She's provided some real insights into the game. Um, I did like it when a commentator tells me things that I don't know. So um, that was a real positive, I thought. And she's got, she's got a great future ahead of her there, I think. Um, you know, as well as, obviously, hopefully a few more years in her career. Um, as for the actual cricket, um, you know, Australia looks a little bit rusty in the first game, unsurprisingly, as you know, England did on occasions that o over the first two matches here. Um, but you know, they didn't quite grab their opportunity. Sophie Devine was very unlucky with a bit of a dodgy third umpire call, I thought. Um, and you know, they didn't make the most of their opportunity there. And then the, the second game today, uh, Australia were much more back on form and won quite easily. So that's what's been happening um, there. Um, you've been watching. All, you've watched all three games live um, of the England West Indies series. Raf, what have you made of what's been going on there? Has it been in the bubble? Um, it's been interesting. Um, it's been kind of a bit lonely at times, I guess. Um, but. I've been really privileged to be able to cover those three games in person and obviously I think the results are, are well known. It's not necessarily unexpected that England have beaten West Indies in all in all three matches. We kind of predicted it, um, but obviously, you know, they West Indies are even rustier than anyone else. Um, given that they've only been back together, able to train as a, as a squad for um, a couple of weeks before the series started. So fair enough and still fair play to them for coming over. Um, I just kind of feel that actually it's so great that the ECB have invested so heavily to get this series on track. I think that being there and being um, in the bubble and, um, you know, being accredited as written press to cover it, you see the effort that's gone into it and you see the every, all of the processes that are in place, you know, having to have a, a COVID passport um, and having to, um, you know, the the having to organise the catering um, and um, organising you know, somewhere for us to sit. And yes, it hasn't been particularly warm, but they provide us with blankets. Um, and you know, you can, obviously we're in a separate kind of ring or a accredited place to the players, um, but you can see that there's so much that's gone into getting things organised for them as well. Um, this is costing the ECB a good amount of money. Um, it's not something that they necessarily had to do. And I just think that having been in the bubble and having seen that, you realise that they do deserve a lot of credit for having got this series on at all. So um, I think, you know, well done to them. We're, we're quick enough to criticise them when we don't agree with what they're doing, so we should give them credit nice. where credit's... Criticise? <laughs> we should give them credit where credit's due, shouldn't we? Um, it has been really great, and obviously you were fortunate and able to um, see the third game, um, the one that was on the BBC, so that's really great. Um, and, um, you know, the other thing obviously as well this week has been that Tom Harrison was on Zoom yesterday and doing a, a press opportunity. So he was at Derby yesterday watching the, the women's match and um, we think he's going to be at Edgbaston today. Yeah, he'll be here today apparently, yeah. And it was really great to actually, you know, to, to feel that he was interacting mm. with the women's game. And you know, yeah. that's actually really something that hasn't happened with the past few, um, you know, chief executives. Um, you know, they've, you know, they'll, they'll play lip service to it occasionally. But, you know, he's actually been to... Rachel Hoher Flint Trophy Games, who was at the game, England game yesterday, he's going to be here today, and he did a special press conference where he put the effort in, and he obviously knew what he was talking about with the women's game, and he had ideas and plans, you know, the women's game, which wasn't just parceled in, you know, with the men's quite explicitly, was it? So what did you make of what he had to say, Raf? 
Yeah, well, I agree with you. Um, there was at one point, I think somebody asked a question that sort of could have taken him down a path to talk about men's cricket. And he was like, no, I'm going to keep talking about women's cricket. Um, so he explicitly kept it on track, which is really great. Um, and yeah, there was interesting. Um, we published a piece this morning um, talking about his reflections on the next ICC media rights deal, haven't we? And he's talking about trying to ensure that the commercial investment um, gets explicitly put back into the women's game so it's it's generating revenue that then has to go into women's cricket which is really important isn't it yeah i've always felt that there was potentially something to be gained from selling the women's rights separately rather than just parceling off with with the men's because then you know you've actually got a genuine value attributed to it and then you know no one can argue with what that value is and ultimately that's where we want to be and it means that other companies can potentially buy those rights as well um and you know so you know it may be that you know bt sport buy the rights for the women Women's World Cup, um, and, you know, they they have already got quite a reasonable focus on women's sport. Um, they they buy a lot of women's football, mm -hmm. so maybe they'll, they'll buy the rights for that, and you know, give Sky some competition mm -hmm. there. So um, you know, and then if you've got those rights earmarked, then they they flow directly back into the women's game, and you go, well, this is women's money, and you don't have the arguments, but well, that should be our money, that should be our money, kind of thing. Absolutely, yeah, and obviously I was really pleased um, to see that he gave a positive answer about supporting women's test cricket um, and hopefully some nice happy thoughts and, and um, conclusions will come out of his conversation with uh, Acting Cricket Australia CEO Nick Hockley. Let's move on then to the big reason and the overall reason why we're here at Edgbaston and why we're able to make this video here, Sid. So it's the final of the Rachel Hayho Rachel Flint Trophy competition. Um, we've been covering every round. We've been very lucky to be able to do that. What have you made of the competition as a whole? Well, you know, if you'd asked me a year ago, um, you know, I'd have been sceptical about it. I've been following women's county cricket for a long time. And, you know, I was obviously on a personal level quite disappointed to, to see kind of uh, things like Berkshire specifically relegated to a sort of second tier or perhaps no tier at all, you know, and I didn't make any secret of that. I remember Mark Robinson very pointedly making a reference to Berkshire at one point in a press conference, <laughs> which was clearly directed at me because, you know, I'd been expressing my disappointment. Um, and, you know, it is hard for, f and I'm a fan here, you know, and it is hard for fans after, you know, fo following something for a long time to you know, be told, well, that, that's not what you need to be following anymore. You need to follow something else. Um, but what's happened this year is that, you know, as again, as a fan, I've really got into it. And um, I've been really excited about this Rachel Hayo Flint Trophy. Um, we've seen some, some great games. Um, and I think it's, it's really delivered on, on the promise, actually. And I think that, you know, ironically, part of the reason that is, is for, the, for the fact that COVID happened and that meant the 100 didn't happen which meant that so much more priority was given to this and we're able to do things like have a final at this wonderful ground here um, and so I'm just really excited about being here today and I really feel really positive about the way this competition has unfolded and I really hope they actually change very little next year when they come to review it because it's been it's been brilliant. Yeah I'd absolutely agree with that. Have you had any particular favourite moments? Oh, well, there's been lots of them, you know, and as a Vipers fan, you know, I'd, um, if I had a Vipers fanboy hat on, I'd be wearing it now. You know, you might expect me to say, you know, uh, George Adams, for example. But I actually want to point towards something, somebody else that's, you know, one of those, another one of those maybe unsung heroes, mm -hmm. which is um, Anisha Patel, um, who's been sort of uh, ploughing a furrow for Warwickshire for a number of years. When I first saw her, it would have been like five or six years ago, I think. Um, a leg spinner um, that um, you know she, her line was okay but she struggled a lot with length early on in her career but someone at Warwickshire obviously thought that they saw something in her and they you know decided well okay you know she's not the perfect bowler yet she's not the finished article but we'll put some in, kind of invest in her if you like and we'll you know carry on selecting her for Warwickshire you know she wasn't great in the field she didn't really offer much with the bat but you know it was an investment and if we look at what she's achieving now for the central sparks in this competition I mean she was fielding at slip she took a great slip catch um, in I think one of their lightning matches um, and you know just to, s to see that development and to see the fact that um, that investment in her has paid off and she's now a proper professional cricketer and I was just so delighted for, for her and for the people that must be so pleased with her her, her coaches for all, all that time so that, that was a really special moment for me just to see her succeeding and take a fantastic slip catch after having really developed as a cricketer. What about you Raf? Yeah, there's been loads of great moments, haven't there? Um, we were so lucky to be there to see Gads' innings at, at the Aegeus Bowl. I think for me, it has to be at the Oval 
last weekend. Um, not only was it so great to watch you really invested in the end of that match, the Vipers v the Stars, and you just, you know, it, it really brought home to me. By the invested, fact you mean like couldn't watch? <laughs> it just really brought home to me the fact that actually this competition has won fans and it has won people like you, um, you know, that that you get that tense and you really care about the outcome and that's great and I think that's happening on a much more macro scale to lots of people who are watching the live streams that's why there's been such great huge numbers for those so there was that but also that amazing partnership between Carla Rudd and Emily Windsor that eventually won the game for the Vipers um, I think that that was a great example of what we've talked about a lot in this competition, which is that it's so important to have a mixture of your younger players coming through, like Emily Windsor, with your um, you know older players with a bit more experience, like Carla Rudd. Um, and it was the two of them together that made that, um, that the last bit of that match so special, I think. And I think that the sides who have explicitly selected all entirely very young players um, or largely very young players have actually missed a trick there because it's the interaction between the two groups of players. You don't develop your younger players if they're not um, get gaining that wisdom and that, um, you know, that sense of game experience that you get from players like Carla Rudd who've been around the domestic game for such a long time and understand those situations. Those interactions are so important and so I do think and I hope that some of the regions may be reviewing their selection policies at the end of the season but we'll obviously have to wait and see for that but overall you know how great was it to to see Vipers get over the line in that way um, thanks to the you know the combined efforts of a, a younger player and a, um, I hope Carl doesn't mind me calling her an older player but yeah, in the scheme of things old, no, no, just, older. just in the scheme of things um, you've got a lot of experience so there you go so Sid um, you've just outed yourself if you hadn't before as a Southern Vipers fan who's going to win today? Well, you know, that, that old cliche of, you know, the, the heart says the Vipers, uh, you know, um, and uh, I would love to see the Vipers win as a fan, um, but I think that Yorkshire are just going to be too... St oh, I did it, I did Oops. it, I did it, <laughs> ooh, eh, 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 eh. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sid has had his accreditation removed for referring to the Diamonds as Yorkshire. Um, <laughs> Northern Diamonds. The Northern Diamonds. Um, I think the Northern Diamonds are going to uh, have too much for them, particularly because we had some news at four o'clock mm -hmm. yesterday, didn't we, Raph? What was the news we had at four o'clock yesterday? So Lauren Winfield Hill has been um, allowed out of the England bubble, released to play in the final today. So she's going to be out there representing the Diamonds in the final today. So that's obviously um, a kind of you know a big fillip to their their batting lineup, I guess. Uh, and England have decided that rather than her sit on the sidelines for their last games against the West Indies, that it would be better for her to be able to play in this final. Yeah, so I think the Diamonds are probably going to be too strong. So, um, you know, my heart's with the Vipers, but my money's on the Diamonds. What about you, Raf? Not literally, we hasten to add. I, no, I, don't gamble, kids. <laughs> I actually think that Southern Vipers are going to win this. And I'm allowed to say that because I'm not explicitly a Southern Vipers fangirl. I think that they've been very strong throughout the competition. They've obviously won every game. And I also think that that match at the Oval did them a lot of good because it was a hard game for them to win. It wasn't another easy win like some of the other ones that they've had and it really showed that they've got a very deep batting order um, and that they've got players you know all the way down who can come in and make a difference so I think that that game will have done them a lot of goods and I think that I'm on the Vipers um, I'm going to come down on the Vipers to win so we'll we'll have to wait and see we'll be bringing you all the action from Edgbaston and let's hope for a really good game